<laughs> nice to see you, old Frizz. I was just telling somebody I've known Glenda since I was 13 years old. So that's, that's a ways back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and uh, also have some really good news. So um, last week, if you recall the message, um, that message touched the heart of Michelle and Ernesto in a very special way. And it really challenged them. And um, they announced this morning that they got married. <laughs> now, some of you might thought you thought they were married, but they weren't. But uh, they decided that it was the right thing to do. God spoke to their heart, and uh, they made that official this week. And we're just super proud of you, and yeah. we're very happy for you, too, as well. Yeah, and, and I told them that's exactly uh, one of the reasons why we have this church going on, yeah. is that, uh, um, oh, man, I just, just love it. I just love it. <laughs> All right. Well, good. And then um, the third thing is just a reminder that we're having a, a get-together over at our home. Uh, Pam's here, so if you did want to bring some food, you can maybe coordinate with her. If not, just show up and just, uh, it's going to be very relaxing. Going to have a campfire going. If you want to want s'mores, bring your s'more stuff. Um, but we're going to have some chili and apple cider and all that kind of stuff. And we're just going to hang out and enjoy each other's company. And I know a lot of you are, have already planned to come, and we're looking forward to spending time with you. Um, look forward to hearing Dave uh, preach he always does a fantastic job, so I know God's laid something really special for us on his heart. And, uh, and so we're going to go open up in prayer. Um, I, think, uh, I think I just want to pray over you guys today. All right? I just want to pray Jesus over you. Um, and I can't, oh, and I, oh, yes, I can't forget my father-in-law is here today. And, and <laughs> my goodness, so, so many blessings. Um, if you don't know, he had a heart attack on Tuesday. And uh, being the man he is, he, he waited to go to the doctor about three days later <clears throat> and, um, and discovered that he has had a 95% blockage in what they call the Widowmaker. And uh, they rate flow from zero to four, and uh, he was a zero. So it's really a miracle that he's even here with us today. Um, yep. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, up, you know, he's had two open heart surgeries over the last 30 years. He had one 30 years ago, another one uh, 20 years ago. <clears throat> and in all that time, they've never been able to put a stent in because his arteries are too small. Well, somehow, maybe technological advances or whatever, but they were able to put a stent in and restore flow at about two and a half um, between the zero and four. And so uh, we're just grateful for that improvement. Uh, we're going to pray today, too, just for additional health restoration for him as well. Okay? So, anyway, let, let's pray together. <coughs> Father, first of all, I do pray over uh, these brothers and sisters here this morning. God, um, we love you so much, and you're such a, a, a great God, a marvelous God, uh, a God of miracles, um, magnificent, and we just honor and glorify you today. And Lord, I do pray over these people that, God, you would just bless them, that you would open up uh, their hearts and minds to the word today, that just like Ernesto and Michelle, they applied what they learned last Sunday and, uh, and a desire to be more like you, be more Christ-like, be more holy. And God, we, we are grateful for that. And we, we all want hearts that way, God. Um, so, so do that. And then, uh, Lord, Enable us through the Holy Spirit to um, work this out through, throughout the week and, and show the love of Christ to others. Lord, I do pray for your blessing on this service today, that you would just be honored in everything we do. Um, thank you for uh, restoring Tony to us, God. Um, just continue to, to heal his body. And Lord, we, we believe that you could even unblock everything that if you wanted to, God. Um, and, but we're just so grateful to have him and what an influence and example he's been on many of our lives. So grateful for him. And so, God, we, uh, we lift up your name. We pray this in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. 
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. First thing I want to say is thank you to Noemia. She did my slides for me. I appreciate that, Noemia. Uh, the second thing I want to say is uh, I am so honored to be up here. I don't take this lightly at all. Uh, it's a grave responsibility, and it's also a great privilege to be able to address God's people. And so uh, when these opportunities come my way, I want you to know that uh, I take them very seriously uh, because I feel like I have a responsibility to God uh, to give you the best message that I can uh, uh, from the Lord. And uh, I feel very much that way uh, 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 to be in front of you today. You know, when I, um, the title of my sermon today is God of the Remnant, and that'll all come to light here real quickly as we go through it. But I, I did a thesis statement that maybe you can bring that up. Yeah. I guess, huh? She skipped my thesis statement. Well, it's just as well because um, nobody puts thesis statements before their sermons. When I looked at it, I thought, Dave, you have written far too many papers and legal briefs over the years that you think you have to have a thesis statement up there. But uh, I'm sorry, that's the way I think, and that's how I do things. And so, a thesis statement is is uh, the point of your paper, the point of your presentation that you intend to prove uh, through, your, uh, through your paper, through your presentation. So my thesis statement is this, God has never been the God of the majority or a popular movement. And that is important for us to understand today. Uh, and I'm not just gonna stand here and give you a bunch of doctrinal stuff uh, uh, just like Tim was saying earlier, the, the power in messages is, okay, how does that apply to us today? Mm -hmm. What do we do about it? And I think we can learn some really good lessons for ourselves and our church uh, by understanding this concept of the God of the remnant. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many examples in Scripture that illustrate that God, and this is Roman number one, many, ex yeah. I hope you have that there. <laughs> There are many examples in scripture that illustrate that God is the God of the remnant. And I'm gonna to try to go through these fairly quickly because you know them all, but it's important to understand them in the context of today's sermon. Uh, going all the way back to Noah, in Genesis chapter six, verse 17 and 18, uh, God said, for behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that's on earth shall die but I will establish my covenant with you and you will come into the ark. You, your sons, your wife, and your son's wives with you. Think about that. I was reading it. It said there were millions and maybe even billions of people on the earth at that time. And God wiped them all out except for eight. That is a really tiny remnant. He said, I'm going to make my covenant with you. Only eight people were left. God, he has just never been the God of the majority and the God of the popular movements. He is very much the God of the remnant. Another example we have is, uh, is the example of Lot. And that's in Genesis 19. Remember how Abraham bargained with God and he said, how about if you can find 10? I mean, just 10 righteous people in the whole metropolitan area, the greater metropolitan area of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, and he couldn't do it. He couldn't even find 10. In fact, we know that only four made it out the door, and one of those didn't even make it too far out of town. She tur his wife turned around and looked back. Uh, here was a society so given over to sin that only four people made it out. That was the remnant uh, of God's people, the, the, the only remnant that was left at that time. Another example is Gideon in Judges chapter 7. And I know these are different circumstances, but the principle is the same. And here's the example with Gideon. He started off with 32,000 people. I mean, he didn't want to do this in the first place. He didn't want to go into battle in the first place, but at least he had 32,000 people. And God whittled it down and whittled it down, and I think he went to like 22,000, and then they did the drinking water test, and it got down to 300. So there was a remnant of people of only 300 left of all those multitudes at the beginning. That's because God is and always has been the God of the remnant. 
Ex uh, Elijah's a good example. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18. Remember, Elijah was kind of lamenting. Oh, God, I'm the only one left. <laughs> what am I going to do? He was whining. Uh, I'm the only one left. Uh, and God said, well, yet yeah, I will leave 7,000 in Israel. And look at this next word. All the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. Out of the entire nation of Israel, that's all there were? Was 7,000 people? that haven't given themselves over to idol worship and bowed the knee to Baal? Evidently, because God said it, that's all there were. That was the remnant at that time of God's people out of the entire nation of Israel. 7,000 people, not very many. Another remnant is in Jer Jeremiah 23.3. It's called the remnant of my flock. And here's what the scripture says there. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. Well, who's he talking about here? Well, when Israel was so corrupt that God said, I'm going to just give you over to the nations. They're going to come in, and they're going to destroy Jerusalem. They're going to cart you all away. He said, well, it looks bad, but one of these days, I'm going to bring back this, this little remnant. Remember, there was the illustration where he, he cut down a tree, and all there was was a stump. And they kind of banded it up, and he said, well, out of this little stump, there's going to be a remnant someday that comes back. But it sure wasn't very many compared to the entire nation of Israel. Again, a tiny remnant of the whole represented God's people. Uh, here's another one. I went to the New Testament here. It's in Revelation 12, 17. And that scripture says, then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. So here we are in the book of Revelation, millions, billions of people in the tribulation, and this scripture says, well, there's this little group. There's this little group of those that have kept my commandments uh, and hold to the testimony of Je Jesus. That was the remnant uh, that was uh, coming out even of the, uh, of, of the tribulation. Now, if you're a, a theologian, a student of uh, comparative religions, the Seventh-day Adventists, they use the scripture, that think it's them. They say, mm -hmm. well, that's us. So I don't think it's the Seventh-day Adventists, but I do think it's what the scripture says. All those who are really and truly followers of Jesus were just that small remnant uh, coming out of the tribulation time. So many, many examples. Now, Jesus, uh, he, Jesus clearly taught the same thing. Uh, our next example is uh, Matthew chapter 7, 13. And this is really a, the, a key thing, right? a key scripture right here. So uh, Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those that, who enter it are many. Here's Jesus himself saying, you know, it's a really narrow little gate. Most everybody's going to be going on the broad road and going the wrong way, and they're going to go straight to destruction. It's a little and it's a narrow gate. Compare that with what you hear today. I mean, is Christianity described as a narrow gate today? No, it's like, hey, we've got a lot going on here. I, I, past the Lutheran church and they were having a beer fast. I'm thinking, well, okay, you know, that'll draw me in. <laughs> and I'm not commenting on, I'm not saying drinking beer is a sin. I'm just saying, is that how you want to draw them in? How's, how's that kind of match up with Jesus? Uh, saying, uh, describing it as, as a narrow gate. Uh, remember when Jesus was talking to the disciples and he said, well, gosh, it's like a, it's like a camel trying to get through the eye of a needle. Uh, for a, a wealthy person to, re to get salvation. Now, I understand that might have been talking about a gate in Jerusalem that's like too small for camels. But either way, he's saying, hey, it's a hard thing. It's a hard road. It's a narrow one. Uh, if you see something that's really broad and looks really appealing, that's not going to be it. <laughs> that's not the way. Uh, Jesus was, again, uh, talking about uh, the remnant, uh, a very small uh, portion. Next example I have 
uh, is a new, another New Testament uh, example, and it's from Jesus also. Uh, it's in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, uh, and I call that one the lawless imposters. And here's that. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So we see even on judgment day, it's going to be, it's not a matter of what you profess, it's a matter of what you possess. Mm -hmm. All these people come before Jesus and said, we talked the talk, we walked the walk, look at what we did, we did cool stuff. Uh, and we did it all in your name, and Jesus is going to say, gosh, I don't even know you. Who are you? Uh, go away, you workers of lawlessness. A large group of people that might talk the talk and walk the walk and know the lingo, uh, they're not going to be part of that remnant. It's always been about a narrow way, not the broad way. So there's just, a, there's just another example. Now, you might say, well, Dave, there's billions of Christians in the world. Yes, but that includes all professing Christians. It includes all nominal Christians. It includes people that fill it out on a blank. I know in the Marine Corps, it's the religion, and you write it down so they have something to put on your dog tags. Well, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't make you a Christian. You know, Christianity, that's what makes it unique in the religions of the world. It's not really even a religion because you don't join it like you join a club. You don't go down and fill out the paperwork and say, okay, I'm a Christian now. Now, every other religion, you can do that. You can go through whatever their process is, uh, and you can and, and go through the procedures, and at the end of it, you will be a Muslim, or you will be a whatever. Uh, that, that's the way you get in. But Christianity, uh, you don't get into Christianity. You don't join it like the club. Christ, true Christianity is being born again and having the Holy Spirit move into your life. That's the mark of a true Christian. So not everybody that says it has it. And Christianity is a remnant. I don't know how many of those billions of Christians in the world really are true Christians. We're not going to know that until the, the, the end of time. But I'm telling you right now, based on what we know of Scripture, it is definitely a remnant of that large number. Very much so. Okay. Um, we're going to go through several parables in Matthew 13. And I went through the whole chapter, and I realized that every parable in that chapter is teaching the same lesson. Every one of them. So it must be important. And, but Jesus is just coming at it in a, in a number of different ways. Uh, the first parable in Matthew 13 was one we all know. It's the sower and the seed. And, of course, that's in... Uh, chapter 13, 1 through 9. And I'm not going to read it all. It, it, it'll, it'll be up there, I think, if you want it. But uh, I'm not going to read it all. But we all know it. There, there, it's the same kind of seed. But there were basically four different results or four different sets of conditions. The first that what was the seed, it landed on the, uh, it landed on the, um, the, the hard ground. And some seeds, fell, or they fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on the rocky ground, didn't have much soil, and it just kind of sprang up for a while, but then it, it died out uh, when the sun came out. There was another seed that fell among the thorns, and it was choked out, uh, and it never developed any fruit. And then there was the last seed that fell on good ground. And, and here's the common thing about seed that falls on good ground. It's always going to produce fruit. If, if, it's, if it's a true crop, if it really was good ground, it will always produce fruit. Now, there might be different amounts. It says some 100-fold, some 60, some 30. So there's different amounts of fruit, but it will always bear fruit. What we see again is a remnant. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven as it exists on earth now, is very much a mixed kingdom. 
It includes those who profess and also those who possess. And here we see a great example of that. Uh, only one of those types of seed. Now they would all say, oh yeah, we're Christians. But only one of them was, was the true seed. Only one of them was actually bearing fruit. Next example is the wheat and the tares, or the, the wheat and the weeds, I think as my translation calls it. It's in Matthew 13, 24 through 30. And it's really, it's, it's telling the same story. Here's this, uh, here's this planting going on in the field. And the, the, the word field, Jesus even defines it as meaning the world. So here's all this planting going on, and you have wheat growing up, something desirable. But somebody comes along and says, who planted the weeds? They're popping up all over the place right alongside the, the real wheat. And you know, we can't hardly tell them apart. What do you want us to do? And in the parable, the master says, well, you're just going to have to let them grow up together, basically till the end of time, till judgment day. It's going to be then that we're finally going to separate them out. And we're going to realize that a whole lot of them were not true. A whole lot of them were weeds. Only a certain percentage of them uh, were actually wheat. Even though right now they look the same, they're growing up in the same field, but a lot of them were wheat. So it's, a, it's the same lesson, the same, the, the same story the same, uh, in this parable. The next one's one we all know. We all know all these, actually. Uh, the mustard seed. Matthew 13 and 31 and 32. Uh, the interesting thing about that one, let me get to my right page here. And that one, uh, the Lord says, well, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. There's that term field again. It means the world. It's symbolic for, for the world. So he sowed the seed in the world. Uh, it is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree. Now, he's not comparing it with sequoias and redwoods. He's comparing it to the other garden plants. And he says, you know, in my garden, this is about the biggest thing you're going to get. They would grow to 9 or 10 foot tall, these mustard bushes, mustard seeds would over at that time. So it's kind of like the biggest plant in the garden. And it was spread out. And, and he says, well, there's going to be... Um, it becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Now, some people uh, interpret this parable in meaning, well, that just means the kingdom of God is going to grow really big. It's going to just grow really big. Well, the problem is with birds, these different kinds of birds, uh, they are symbolic of all different kinds of people. And they're all finding refuge under this umbrella of the kingdom of God, of the kingdom of heaven, but they're not all real. A lot of them are, are, are evil birds, angry birds. <laughs> so they're, they're, not, they're, they're, not, they're not the true birds. Uh, so we're again seeing a remnant, which is only a part of the whole represented by this parable, just like every other parable we've seen in Matthew uh, 13 so far. Next example is the leaven. We all know about the, about the, the leaven and the bread. It's just one verse, it's verse 33. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was leavened. Again, some commentators say, well, this just means it's really going to grow. It's going to get big because, uh, because that leaven said it. Well, leaven is always the symbol of evil. It's always the symbol of sin in the entire Bible. This would be the only place in the entire Bible where it's not. Uh, if, and plus, it would be out of context with every other parable we've seen in this same chapter, which is talking about a hole that's been contaminated with some, con, some, uh, some, counterfeit, uh, some, some counterfeit activity. So again, we see, well, you got a big loaf of bread. The kingdom of heaven is like a big loaf of bread, but it's full of leaven. A lot of what you see is size, but it's not really uh, true. It's not genuine. It's not sincere. It's the same. It's the same story he's telling in this parable. It's a. It's, it's a big, <laughs> maybe kind of a moldy or maybe kind of a corrupt loaf of bread because a lot of what's in it is is, is not really good. Another example, Matthew thirteen forty four. It's the hidden treasure. 
hidden treasure, it says the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. There's that word field again. It stands for, it's symbolic of the world. Which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Uh, let me ask you, how many treasures are in that field? Were there hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of them? No, just one. Again, we see a small remnant, a small part of the whole being true and real and sincere with this one treasure out of the entire field uh, symbolizing it. Here's that one, the pearl. Verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. Um, and the, the next sentence is not on my uh, on here. But anyway, uh, he, he, uh, uh, he sells all that he has to, to be able to buy just those, th those one particular pearls. Now, how many pearls were there in the sea? Well, a whole lot of them, but these were the only ones that were the true pearls, the, 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 the pearls that he wanted, the pearls that he desired. Again, we see a remnant a small part of the whole. Uh, we're not done yet. Uh, the net full of fish, Matthew 7, 13, 47 through 49. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that's thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous. Whole load of fish in there. The net drew a whole lot of them in. Uh, but at the end of the time, it said it's just like the wheat and the tares. Well, that's when we're going to have to separate them out. There's going to be only one kind of good fish in here. There's, and, and everything else is going to be the, the bad fish. Again, we've seen an example of the remnant through the parables of, of Matthew 13. All right, we're going to jump to one more uh, in Matthew 25. And again, it's something that you all know. It's the sheep and the goats, Matthew 25, 31 through 33. And it says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and then he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Again, we see a separation. We see a remnant. We see only a part of the whole actually being true believers, uh, true disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this Roman numeral three, I thought, well, we're in the middle. So I'll throw it in to be a provocative statement or to wake up those that might have gone to sleep. <laughs> like my family says, is he still talking up there? <laughs> oh, incidentally, uh, thanks for coming today. My family showed up. Uh, I told Connie this morning, if Aaron doesn't come, I'll use her for all my negative illustrations. <laughs> I'm in the clear. You're in the clear. <laughs> but she's here, so I was able to you know, cross those out. <laughs> but Roman numeral three, is God is not concerned with the behavior of the lost, but he's vitally concerned with the behavior of his own people. Now you might be saying, what are you talking about, Dave? Well, here's what I'm talking about. God cares deeply about reaching the lost, but he's not trying to rehabilitate them. Jesus came and he died for the sins of the whole world. He loved the world so much, but he came to save them from their, their sin. He didn't came to shape them, come to shape them up and modify their behavior and improve their behavior because God's not going to call unsaved people to do righteous things because they won't and they can't. They're spiritually unable. So why would God say, all you rascals out there, shape up? It would do no good. We know that. Uh, my good friend Tim Burnett, when I complain, he has often said, uh, Dave, sinners sin, that's what they do. And he, as usual, he's right. My wife says about the same thing. She says, Dave, don't expect saved people, or don't expect lost people to act like saved people. 
and she's right too, and I don't. Uh, I'm comfortable with that. I, I, I understand that. And even God understands that. Uh, that he's not going to waste his time telling a lot of people to act right uh, because they can't do it. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, we have an example in the Old Testament when, when God called Israel into the land that he tell them, all right, go to those nations that occupy the land and kind of fix them up. You know, modify their behavior, maybe teach them my ways, and, and then you can all move in and get along with them and you'll, you'll be good. He didn't say that. He said, they're judged already, and I'm using you as the instrument of my judgment, and it's hard to read, isn't it? He sends them in, he says, kill every living thing. It's brutal. It's brutal to read, but doesn't that tell us about God's holiness and about the, the, the totality of God's judgment? Because uh, he, in fact, he told the Israelites, don't go in and try to change your behavior because next thing you know, you're going to be acting like them. Uh, all, all I can do is judge them. There will come a time uh, at, at the great white throne judgment. We see that in Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Um, and I'm just going to read uh, uh, verse uh, 14 and 15. It says, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That great white throne judgment is all about judgment. It's not about behavior modification. God's not going to say, I'm going to send you to rehab. I think there's hope for you. We're going to send you into this uh, really good behavior modification program, and maybe in a year we'll talk, and we'll see how you're doing. No, I'm sorry. Uh, at the great white throne judgment, it is all about judgment for unbelief. Not for bad behavior. God expected a bad behavior. It's for unbelief mm -hmm. and failure to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Mm -hmm. So God's not really concerned with the behavior of the lost. He just wants them to get saved. But you know what? God is vitally concerned with our behavior, with the behavior of the saved. That's what it's all about when it comes to us. There's a judgment seat of Christ, uh, and we can read about it in 2 Corinthians 5.10 and also 1 Corinthians 3.12 through 15. And rather than taking the time to go to it, uh, you know, it is all about behavior. It is all about what we've done for Jesus since we've been saved. The judgment seat of Christ isn't about, isn't about damnation. It isn't about judgment for sin. It's about what have you done for me in this life I've given you as a Christian? Uh, and we're going to get rewards or not based on what we've done. In fact, the... the the 1 Corinthians 3 reference talks about, well, if your foundation was built upon wood, hay, and stubble, it's going to be burned away, but, but you won't be <coughs> lost. It says specifically, you're not going to be lost, but you're going to lose rewards if you haven't done things to advance the kingdom, if you haven't behaved as a Christian. So he's very concerned with our behavior, with the behavior of his people. Always has been always will be. Now, um, God commands his people to be holy. He does it in Leviticus 19.2. And again, he's talking to the children of Israel there. He's talking to his chosen people in the, in the Old Testament times. Uh, it's, it's also in 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16, which I hope I have here. Yes, uh, in 1 Peter 1.16, it just says, Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Again, he's talking, God's talking to his people. He's not talking to the lost. Why, why command the lost to be holy when they couldn't do it even if they wanted to? You can't talk to a spiritually dead corpse and tell it to do anything because it can't and it won't. So God's not, not, not doing that, but he is telling his people, be holy, act right, 
because I'm holy. Now, why can God tell us and not them? Well, because we're capable of doing it. Because we have a Holy Spirit that lives within us and gives us the capability of living righteously before God. Now, we don't always do it. We are like yo-yos. We have our ups and our downs. But we have the capability to do it living inside us in the person of the Holy Spirit. Who do you think whispers to you all the time when you are getting ready to do something you know you shouldn't? It's the Holy Spirit that's doing that. Now, we can ignore him, and we can say no, and we can put him off, and after years of doing that, we won't be able to hear his little small voice anymore. But he's in us, and he gives us the capability of living righteous lives for Christ that the unsaved don't have that capability. That's why he is so concerned about our behavior. Okay. No sermon's any good unless you talk about how it applies now. So how does the doctrine of the remnant apply to us today? Here's a really important way I think it applies. It applies when it comes to revival. Here's what I mean about that. Take a look at 2 Chronicles 7.14. All of us just think that's the revival verse, isn't it? We all pray, we love to pray that revival verse. It says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal from land. Look at that. He's not addressing that to the world. He didn't address that to the pagan nations back in the Old Testament. It says right there, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves, he's talking to the Christians. So we all pray for revival. We do it all the time and we say, oh Lord, bring revival. But I'm afraid that most Christians don't have any intention of changing their own behavior or actually doing what this says in order for God to bring revival. I think a lot of Christians pray this and they're always thinking about some other evil person they know. Yeah. God, if you could just get them to change your ways and shape up, then we're going to have revival in this country. No, they, don't, they can't shape up because they're lost. It's you I'm asking to shape up. It's my people. I'm saying, humble yourselves. Turn from your wicked ways. And then I'm going to heal you. He's talking to his people. But a lot of us don't look at it that way. So many people pray this prayer, but they are not willing to change their own ways. Now, I'm going to use an example. I hope I don't make anybody mad, but I guess I don't really care. Uh, <laughs> this isn't a political sermon, but I'm going to use a political example because it happened just recently here in Kansas. We had an opportunity to vote on a very modest pro-life initiative. All it would have done is said that abortion comes under the jurisdiction of the legislature. So the legislature can pass any sorts of regulations or restrictions that they might see fit. Those are the people we elected to do that, by the way. Uh, and it said it's not a fundamental right under the Kansas Constitution, like the Kansas Supreme Court said, but it's something that is subject to legislative control. We can put some limits on it. You know, Kansas is a destination state for abortion. I'm ashamed. I am deeply ashamed. We have people coming from states all around because of our lax abortion laws. We are the home of George Tiller, uh, who's gone now, but there are other George Tillers just waiting in the wings, I think, to come along and, and fill his shoes. Well, I know that politics are never going to change the world, and I know we're not going to change the world by political activism. Jesus didn't do that. He didn't spend his time picketing against the Romans and all that kind of stuff. I know that. But... As Christians, if we're really serious about praying these kind of prayers, when we have the opportunity to perform a righteous act, we need to do it. Or else when we pray prayers like 2 Chronicles 7.14, I think they stink to God. I think they make him mad. When he hears us all praying, Oh, Lord, bring revival. We want it so bad. And we're not willing to change our behavior one iota to help make it happen. 
I mean, one of these days, God's going to say, hey, I gave you a chance to kind of put some feet on your prayers there. What'd you do? Living in this country, you would think that the most important right in the world is the right to kill your baby. I'm sorry, it's not. Shame on us. Now, that's one reason I have thrown out political labels. I refuse to be defined anymore by political labels. I don't want to be a conservative. I don't want to be a moderate. I don't want to be a liberal. I don't want to be a Republican. I don't want to be a Democrat. I want to be a Christian. I want my positions to be informed by the word of God. When you ask me why I think as I do on a position, I should be able to explain to you why, scripture and verse, why I believe that way. And that's how I had to live my life. People have said, Dave, well, you're just pro-life because you're a conservative. No. I throw that out. I'm not going to, I think you should too, throw out those political labels. I'm pro-life because God is. I'm pro-life because that's the scriptural position. And on any position, that or any other one, we all ought to be able to give a reason, a scriptural reason for why we take that position and why we believe what we do. Uh, Kansas is supposed to be a conservative state. You see what we did on that issue. It goes much deeper than whether you're conservative or not. That vote would not have been that way if a whole lot of professing or, or, or nominal Christians wouldn't have voted uh, as they did. That, that law was rejected overwhelmingly in Kansas. I was surprised at how lopsided the vote was against a modest pro-life measure. It wasn't even a big deal. In fact, that's how it is nationwide now. At the federal government, the Supreme Court just said, hey, that's a matter for legislatures. That's all we were doing is trying to align ourselves with, uh, with, with the federal position now. So how many Christians were praying Second Chronicles 7.14, but when given an opportunity to do one little thing, you know, to put some feet on their prayers, how many of them threw that out? Because it might involve but maybe a change in behavior a little bit, you know? So anyway, that's, my, that's the political... Uh, portion of this <laughs> of this message. Oh, one more. <laughs> we have another opportunity with the midterm voting coming up here real soon. And again, I'm not going to tell you go in and vote for this party or that party or this label or that label. I'm going to say we have a responsibility to know what position the candidates take and vote for those that stand most closely with biblical values that we pull right from the Word of God, not because we have some label stuck on us. So we have another chance in November to at least do a small righteous act, putting some feet in our prayers a little bit while we're praying Second Chronicles 714 to really show the Lord we're kind of serious about it, you know? We really do intend to, uh, to pay the price and, and change our behavior. Because, again, God cares about our behavior, not the behavior of the world. So, anyway, there's that. Uh, the second place that this applies uh, is it applies to church growth. Where on earth did we get the idea that growing big was the goal? We didn't get that from Jesus. We just went through a whole series of parables and and wheat and tares and narrow roads and all those things. Can you see the disciples ever sitting around with Jesus and talking about their marketing campaign? Can you see them discussing whether their services are seeker friendly? No. Growth was never the goal uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm in favor of growth, but here's why. I want to grow organically as a church. I want to grow because we're doing the right thing. I want to grow because there's spiritual life here. You know, across the world of biology, if there's no growth, you know what that means? It means you're dead. So, I mean, I would really be concerned if we didn't grow here, but not because our goal is to try to grow and, and, and uh, 
and market ourselves, and, and, and that should never be our goal. I want to grow because it's a sign of life and that we're doing the right thing here. That we're being like Jesus and people see it. And they say, they say, well, what's different about you? How are we going to evangelize people if we're just like them in every way? What would you tell a person uh, if, they, if they said, well, all right, what, what, what's, what's the big deal with being a Christian? What do you have that I don't have? You think like me. You talk like me. You act like me. You have the same worldview I do. You have the same goals that, that I do. What's different about you? The way someone said it, they said, well, if you were accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Ooh. Now, i got to say, there's been times in my life the, the answer is probably, well, not much. You know? Because, I mean, we have some kind of a powerless Christianity now where, where we act and think and talk just like the world does. Uh, and uh, so I don't, know what the, I don't know what we could tell them about what the big difference is between what we have and what they, ha they have. So I would hope that our church would grow because they see something in us. We're showing the love of Jesus and we're living like we ought to as Christian people. Then we, I'm, I'm happy to grow that way but not because we're trying to grow big. That's contrary to everything Jesus ever taught. Boy, if Jesus was trying to grow big, he didn't do very well. <laughs> I know that in, uh, I just looked this morning at John 17, uh, and he was praying uh, for his disciples. In fact, it's worth reading. He says, um, let me find it. I just looked it up this morning, so it's not up here. I jotted it down while I was eating my peanut butter toast. <laughs> Here it is. John 17, um, 9 and 10. He says, I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world. Wow. But for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine and I'm glorified in them. How many did he have at that time? He had 12 and like a, one of them was a bum. You know, he, he had 11. Even at the time of the upper room in Jerusalem, there was just 120 of them up there. So if Jesus had been going for big numbers, boy, he, he failed, didn't he? But he was never going for that. Oh, and unless you think that he was just praying for the disciples, look at verse 20, John 17, 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. He's praying for us too. Yeah. Yep. He's concerned about his little remnant mm -hmm. and how they act and what we do. He wasn't, I mean, he came to save the world. That's what he was there for. But he certainly wasn't praying for them uh, at this time. So it applies to church growth. Now, I hope that, uh, I don't offend anybody here either, but uh, not really. <laughs> We hear a lot in churches these days about everyone is welcome. And our church is a hospital. I agree with those statements. I do. But most of them that say it don't mean it. When they say everyone's welcome, that really just means, don't worry, you can come here. We will never make you feel uncomfortable by pointing out sin. We won't do that. That's what they usually mean by that. Everybody can come and can sit there for months or years and never, ever feel uncomfortable because their sin is never, ever addressed or pointed out. There are churches in this town and all over the place, I can name them, so could you, that will not preach on certain controversial topics that they feel are different than popular culture because they don't want to offend people and they don't want to lose numbers over it. So everybody can go there for years and they can feel really good and they can be happy and they can hug each other, and they can have a really good time, and they can sing great songs, but they're never confronted with sin. The truth is never spoken, and the church becomes a powerless, hollow non-entity. On the hospital thing, too, I guess I have a pet peeve about that, because, yeah, we're a spiritual hospital, but my daughter Erin, this is a good example. She's... <laughs> 
She's supervisor of outpatient at, at Providence Hospital. What if people came to her hospital and the doctors and the nurses were the friendliest they've ever seen? We are. They are. They hugged them. <laughs> they, they said nice things to them. But then what if they sent them home without treatment? What kind of hospital would that be? At best, it would be a waste of time. At worst, it's going to be dangerous because you're sending people with life-threatening diseases home thinking they're good. So what good is a church that's a spiritual hospital that doesn't ever treat anybody's spiritual diseases? Amen. What if they can come here week after week after week after week and never hear anything that makes them squirm, never makes them hear anything that, that makes them believe that, that what they're doing might be sin, and they go their way feeling good about themselves, and they're spiritually dying and they're spiritually dead. Yeah. They're worse off because they think they're good. Yeah. I think just last, last week Andy talked about it's like a, what is, a, a spiritual morphine drip to hell of people come to churches where they're never told. It's, I'm okay. You're okay. Everybody's right. Nobody's wrong. Take a step back and compare it to what Jesus said. Compare it to all the examples I brought up today. Preach it. Not, not even in the same ballpark. Yeah. Not even similar. And I'm afraid that's where uh, we are today. You know, I'm not saying that every big church is necessarily bad. I can't go that far. But I think I can say this. The bigger you are, the more opportunity to see there is that you become an event rather than uh, a church committed to the truth uh, and, and to preaching the truth. When you have that many people, it's hard to say things that might drive some of them away. It's hard to say something that might interfere with that, uh, that uh, spirit of unity that they got going there. Uh, it, it, so it, it, it's hard when, you, when you're that big to do that. It becomes all positive, 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 and we're all good, and don't ever bring up that sin stuff. Uh, because that's just going to divide people and, and, and get people upset. So I do think that that's a real danger, and the larger it is. I can picture big, giant loaves of bread full of leaven uh, in these big churches and, and in these big institutions. And again, I can't say that about all of them. There are good big churches, but boy, they have to be careful mm -hmm. to make sure that they don't fall into that, that kind of a trap. And I think the church in America is, has fallen very deeply uh, into that trap. Okay, I've got just some questions for us um, to kind of wrap this up. Um, if the huge church movements are so great, why is the church so weak in society today? Why is that? I think we know. Why can't you tell the difference between Christians and the world? Why not? I think it's because we've gotten away from this whole idea that Christians are called to live holy lives because we have the ability to do it. And I think it's exposing the fact of how many so-called Christians out there either are not really Christians or are badly backslidden Christians. The fact that so many Christians don't live anything close to a holy life or a life that's any different than anybody else in the world. Uh, I covered this earlier. What do we have to offer the lost? What would you tell them? Uh, well, I got this fire, fire escape for you. You know, just say these words of this little prayer and Jesus will come in your heart and then you won't go to hell. But you can go out and live however you want. Well, that, that's about all a lot of us, uh, a lot of us could say. Uh, in answer to that, I already, I already said this. When, if we're accused of being Christians, would there be enough evidence to convict us? Uh, the next one is, why can't we pass a modest pro-life initiative, even in conservative Kansas? I think we know why again. Spiritual thing. Yeah. It's because not the evil people out there are acting like we expect them to act. Yeah. It's because we're not expecting the way that God expects us to act. And we can't even take a little step 
to do something uh, uh, to, 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 to act righteously on even a little thing like that. We can't do it. We will always be a remnant, but God has always used the remnant to change the world, not be a part of it. What has happened to us? What has happened to us? God's not concerned with the behavior of the lost, but of his people. Again, what has happened to us? And I guess finally, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? I mean, it's an individual thing. It's a family thing. It's a church thing. But it certainly starts there. I mean, it, it won't do us any good to stand up and rail against the sin uh, in the world because those are lost people. We just need to reach them. That's what we need to do for them. We need to, we need to reach them. We're not going to change their behavior. Right. We're not going to modify uh, the way they act because they're lost. All they have to look forward to is judgment unless we can pluck them out of the fire. Mm -hmm. But as the Christian people, we need to think, hey, we're the ones called to be holy. We're the ones called to speak the truth even when it's hard. We're the ones called to be the remnant and to be like Jesus. What are we going to do about it? <coughs> Do. That's all I got. When you're talking about they're not going to change their behavior, if we work on ourselves and become righteous and be the example, we will cause them to desire to change themselves. Got to have something to show them, don't you? Yep. Always. Yes? If as Christians, when we pray, and we know that, like, I have people that I work with. If we feel the fire of those, for those, maybe <coughs> that would make us do more. we got to speak out. We have to speak out. I know we could be thrown in jail or we could be lose our jobs. So that's what a lot of Christians now are afraid of. If you speak out, you lose your job. It's like you don't speak out, you get fired. We have to speak out, and if we don't, then we're going to be safe. If we feel the fire of those that are lost and we pray for them, God will show us how. We just have to feel the fire of our lost No, I'm retired, you know, so it's like it's, it's, it's kind of easy for me to say these things, but I understand it's a difficult place, a difficult world we live in. But I will say we're in good company uh, of those that spoke out and uh, they really did pay the price for it. I was thinking about all of Jesus' disciples today. Look what happened to every one of them uh, uh, as far as uh, to, the, to their bodies. Dave, you know, something that, that Jesus was very clear on is that he said, how will they know that you're, that, that you're a Christian? How will they know that you're a disciple of Christ? They'll know because you love others. You love one another. And... Um, and it's, it's one thing to point out sin and all around us, but if we're actively loving others around us, that's what's going to be the difference. People that are unsaved love themselves only. They may appear to love others, but really, down deep, they only have the ability to love themselves. Just like you said, we're empowered by the Holy Spirit to actually love others in, in a way, meet needs, actually care about them. And uh, I think sometimes we push all that down. We're too busy with our own little lives to, to do that. We do. And if we do not listen to the Holy Spirit, we are going to be just as selfish and just as full of self-love as every lost person. Yes. Yep. Because we're not saved because we were a better cut of people. Right. Right. Not at all. We're in the same boat. The only difference is we've been washed by the blood of the Lamb and, 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 and we have the Holy Spirit to help us now that we're saved to live those kind of righteous lives that we couldn't live before. So that's the only way we're going to show the love of God is to have the Holy Spirit actively working in us to, to work that, that, that out in us. Thank you, Dave, for the word today. It was good. Uh, thinking about growth of our church, uh, 
and I think that every one of us are growing here uh, spiritually, and I think that's what God wants. Uh, you know, you talked about being a Christian, and uh, the world thinks of it as being a religion, but in the New Testament, when uh, you know, people in Antioch, when they became Christians, they were Christ-like, and they uh, adopted the, the things of Christ, and that's why people knew the difference in them. Somebody would ask me, in my younger uh, days as a, as a believer, they, they would have said, are you a Christian? I'd say, no, I'm a Baptist, you know, because uh, that's what I was always raised, you know, I'm a Baptist. And, uh, you know, you talked about the, the power that we have to be holy, too, by the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. And uh, God wants us to make disciples, right? And uh, sometimes we, you know, uh, I just was on a motorcycle trip just this week down in Texas. But all week long I thought, Lord, you know, just use your Holy Spirit to, to let me speak to somebody, you know, about, you know, being a Christian and uh, you know you miss those opportunities right you see somebody the Lord brings them by and oh man that was it Lord maybe I should have said something there you know and you, you pass it up you know but uh, finally the last day at the motel I just the lady at the counter I go man I got to say something you know to somebody so I asked this lady I said you know do you go to church anywhere and uh, she goes yeah we go to church of Christ you know and uh, so I said, well, do you know the Lord? And she goes, yeah, I sure do. And I said, well, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the afterlife after this is what's more important, right? Uh, this world doesn't matter anyway. It's the next life that we're going to be in heaven, and that's what's important. And she, you know, she just thanked me right there that I spoke those words to her, maybe to encourage her to, to yeah. say something else to somebody. So, yep. you know, you plant a seed, and that's how you, you use that holiness inside of you to, to, to reach others, to, to be an example to them. So I want to challenge you this week, you know, uh, don't be that some person that says, uh, like Dave says, uh, how could you prove you as a Christian if you went to court, you know, if uh, somebody said, show me the proof, you know. And a lot of times that's the way we live our lives. We just go through the daily things. We come to church here on Sunday. We're growing spiritually in Sunday, learning about the Holy Spirit, but we're not letting the Holy Spirit live through us through the week. Yeah. So, all right, that's all I got to say. All right, let's pray. Father, just thank you for your word today. Lord, just uh, thank you for challenging us through the word, Lord, today to live a holy, separated life, Lord, to really be Christians, to be uh, part of the remnant, Lord. We know that we are part of the remnant, those that have, us that have accepted you as our Savior, Lord, we know that we're going to heaven. But help us to be, uh, share that with the lost, Lord, and make disciples here and bring other people to know you from our testimony, Lord. And help us to do that through this week, Lord, to be sensitive to your Holy Spirit living inside of us. And I ask these things, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. amen.